destruction of the wicked. But tonight, I'm excited. This is one of my favorite presentations. But as I told you, get your fingers, massage your brain. <laughs> KG, I'm going to work your brain tonight. This is a fascinating, fascinating prophecy. This is one of the prophecies that is responsible for converting more Jews to Christianity than any other Bible prophecy. I love it. I love teaching this. And I hope that God will allow me to just have clarity of thought, clarity of speech, that you can catch the, the significance, the deep importance of this topic, these prophecies that I'm going to cover with you tonight as we discuss Jesus' perfect judgment. But again, as you know, before I preach, I'm going to pause and ask God to speak through me. So will you be so kind as to pray with me? Loving Father, Lord, I thank you that your word is just so rich and full. And Lord, if we will be a diligent Bible student, we can have that biblical understanding of these topics that can sometimes be confusing, sometimes leave us scratching our heads, but Lord, I know that you have told us your spirit will guide us into all truth. So Lord, as we open up this amazing prophecy tonight, these two prophecies, Lord, please cleanse me with the blood of Christ. Please fill me with your spirit. Father, please allow me to speak with clarity, with conviction, that you might be glorified, that your word might be understood. And Lord, please cleanse me with the blood of Christ. Hide me behind the cross that Jesus would shine through and that we would have a clearer picture of what it means to walk with him. And Lord, please, please bless my brothers and sisters. For many of them, this will be the first time that they hear this information. So Lord, please let their minds just be open to hear your voice and not mine. And Lord, bless us. Guide us by your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we touched on this in the Q&A. Revelation has these three angels' messages. And we know very clearly from the very first chapter of Revelation 1 that Revelation has these symbols, these rich symbols that are happening. Uh, and and it even, Jesus even says, I gave my word through my messenger to John, and he uses the Greek word simoneo, which means to tell things in signs. So we know much of it's going to be symbolic, and so we need to ask very important questions and try to find biblical pieces to unlock the symbolism. Right? Because you remember this morning from 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21, Scripture, no prophecy of Scripture is of what kind of interpretation? You remember that P word? Private. Right? So we want to know what the Bible has to say about its own prophecies. So we'll dive in. I'm not going to cover all the three angels' messages tonight. I want to hone in on part of the first angel's message. Revelation 14, 7. This angel cries out, and again, it's with a loud voice. It's not something happening in secret. It's not something done in corners. It's for the whole world. Fear God and do what? How do we, what does it mean to fear God? Does it mean that I run from him and don't have a relationship with him? No, when you study that phrase out, to fear God, it means to recognize who he is, but it means to give him that deep reverence. How do I give glory to God? I can say it. But the better way to give glory to God is through how I live my life. Are you and I glorifying God by how we live our lives or are our lives an affront to God? It's an important question. But fear God, give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment, what does it say? Has come. And there's where some people, oh, hour of judgment freaks me out. What are you talking about? Something I want you to recognize, this phrase, the hour of his judgment has come, that is what's known as a present perfect. Just when you thought that you escaped the evils of English sentence diagramming, I've resurrected it and put it right back in your life. It was interesting to me. I learned more about English studying Greek than I did in any English class. Because I finally begin to understand why parts of speech were so important. Okay, and so this phrase has come. It's a present perfect. What it means is it's action that took place in the past 
but it has an impact into the present day. How cool is that? Just how it's written in the original language and then how it's translated, we get an implication that, yes, it started back here, but it now has an enduring and an ongoing impact. So something about this judgment started some time ago, but now it's enduring and it's still affecting us today. Well, what does that mean? That the hour of God's judgment has come. How many of you just on the surface think that sounds just a little ominous? If you're just being honest with me. I mean, judgment, it has come. A little freaky. Well, is that a bad thing? How do we understand this? For God's people, is judgment something to be feared? Should I be worried? These are fair questions. So how do we understand this? Well, what we have to do is, again, I'm always going to push this to you. As a disciple of Christ, you've got to learn how to compare Scripture with Scripture. You've got to be a faithful student. And what we have found over the years is that the books of Daniel and Revelation, many scholars have actually referred to them as the prophetic twins. Because some things that are mentioned in Revelation, we have to go back to Daniel to find out their interpretation. So we have to compare Daniel and Revelation, and we get that fuller understanding of what is happening. So this final judgment, Revelation gives the what? Fear God and give glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Okay, Daniel gives the when and the where, and Jesus gives the assurance for you and me. Amen? Isn't that beautiful? So what about this? Well, a couple of things I want you to see. Judgment has to take place before the second coming of Christ. Jesus has told us, Revelation 22 and verse 12, My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. And we studied that word a little earlier this morning, right? It was that Greek word ergon. And it just means our deeds, the things that we do as a response to the love of God. So here Jesus is coming. It's the second coming. You are either ready to meet him or you're not, right? There's no second chance. And so when he's coming, he's going to give a reward. And there's only two rewards available. Eternal life or eternal damnation. Which reward do you want? I want eternal life, amen? I want my name written there, Brian. I want my name written in the book, right? That page wide and fair. I I love that line from the song. But Jesus is bringing the reward. Notice what he also said a little earlier in the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, verse 27. Jesus declared, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So this wasn't just something that John came up with in a vision in Revelation. You say, well, what does it matter? Do you know that some of the Protestant reformers would not even study the book of Revelation? Who's heard of Martin Luther? You say, well, I haven't heard of him. Well, how many of you have a friend that's in a Lutheran church? It comes from Martin Luther, right? He's the founder of the Protestant Reformation in many ways. Martin Luther went on record as saying, book of Revelation, nobody can understand it. In fact, I don't even think Christians should study it. But it's interesting to me that the very first verse says that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why would I not study the revelation of Jesus Christ? But notice what we see here, beautiful harmony. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, I'm going to be coming. I'm coming in all the glory of heaven. I'm bringing my reward with me. And the same thing is then echoed by Jesus in Revelation 22. So what I'm trying to get you to see is Jesus is able to offer the reward because the judgment's already taken place. Would it not be premature for Jesus to offer a reward when no judgment has taken place? You understand what I'm saying? I just want you to see there's a timeline that is being established here in Scripture. So why does there even need to be a judgment? Well, we've talked about the angel whom the Bible tells us was the covering cherub. He was one of those angels right at the throne of God, right there in the very glory of God, as close as you could be without being God yourself. And we know that Lucifer took his eyes off God, and he wanted the worship that was being given to God. He looked at himself. 
In fact, we're told in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, it says you were perfect until the day that iniquity was found in you. In all your ways, your pipes. He was covered in jewels. He was beautiful. He wasn't this horns and fangs and spiked tails and all this stuff that um, medieval mythology came up with. Lucifer was an angel of light. He was referred to as the morning star. Okay? Yes, he took his eyes off God. And this rebellion in heaven, it's talked about in Revelation 12. You can make a little note on your text guide if you want to go to read about how war broke out in heaven. It's described to you in Revelation 12. But it says, this rebellion in heaven introduced a question into the universe about God's character, his fairness, and his integrity. So one of the points of contention throughout the universe, and even on this earth today, is God who he claims to be? Can God be trusted? Are his laws fair? Those are questions, right? And so really, what's at the heart of settling this judgment Who's really under the microscope? God is. And all the worlds, all the universe is looking to see, is God who he claims to be? And so we see that a major theme of the book of Revelation is this conflict between Christ and Satan. Some have even referred to it as a great controversy. And really what needs to be settled at the end of the day is can God be trusted? Is he who he claims to be? Is his word really what it says. But I believe that the Bible reveals in the judgment, God reveals in the judgment that he has done everything he can to save and Satan has done everything he can to destroy. That's really what we find in the record of sacred scripture. So where does this judgment take place? Revelation says that it began and the effects are enduring. But let's go to the prophetic twin. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Let's turn back and let's find out where this judgment is taking place. Okay? So we go to Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. And Daniel says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Ancient of Days is a reference to God the Father. Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. Hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels, a burning fire, a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. How many of you are thinking great majesty at this moment? Can you imagine this scene? This is a scene of majesty that we can't even comprehend. Thousands of ten thousands? This is all the heavenly host that are gathered around the Father. Why? For what purpose? Daniel tells us very clearly. What was seated? The court was seated, and what was opened? Did we also read in Revelation chapter 20 earlier today that it says that the dead were judged according to the books? And there was another book. What was the name of that other book? Book of Life. And in some places it's referred to as the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, But here are the books. Same books that are being mentioned in Revelation. And it's the books, it's the records of those who have rejected God. How many of you would like to have the record of your rejection or sin against God completely wiped out? Where do I sign up? Right? I want that record eradicated. And that's exactly what the blood of Jesus does. It takes away the record of our sin. And it's covered by the blood of Jesus. And instead of that record of my sin, my failing against God, my rebellion against him, what stands in my place is the record of Christ's righteousness. But there will be many, as you and I both know, as we all know, there will be many who reject that blood. There will be many who reject Jesus. Revelation 6 says that they cried out for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them when Jesus came. So this court is opened. So if it's at the throne of God... The judgment began, back in Revelation, it said that it began. We don't know when it began, but where is this judgment taking place according to Daniel? If it's at the throne of God, the throne of God is in heaven, so by natural deduction, we know that this judgment is taking place in heaven, yes or no? Are, are you with me so far? All right, let's continue to look. So when does the judgment take place? 
And I've asked the question, and I think I've, I've already told you how I believe, does this judgment take place before Christ comes? Well, didn't we look at multiple references where he said, I'm coming and what is with me? So there seems to be a very strong indication that the judgment takes place before the second coming of Christ. We looked at this verse, right? You've seen this multiple times. I'm not showing you this is something new. It's just a reminder. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone. So that means there's nobody left out of this judgment on the first round. Everyone according to his work. So when does this judgment begin? To find the answer... We have to go back and we have to look for time prophecies that are given in the Old Testament. Daniel is brought into vision and he's being shown things by the angel Gabriel. Now we believe that Gabriel is the angel who took Lucifer's place after his fall. He's become the covering cherub. And notice what he says to Daniel. It's a phrase that when we look at it, sounds a little weird. For 2,000... 300 days, then the sanctuary shall be what? Now, friends, I've been a Seventh-day Adventist pastor since 2008. And when I think of the sanctuary being cleansed, I want to know if the carpet's been cleaned. I want to know if the windows have been dusted. Have we picked up our trash? Were there any bulletins left over from weekend service? Did we leave any water bottles? Right? Are the bathrooms clean? Are the paper supplies? Is that the sanctuary that's being talked about? We're not sure just yet, right? Probably not, but what are we talking about? In Daniel's day, which sanctuary do you think his mind would have gone to? Probably something different than we understand, right? So let's try to figure that piece out. So there's a couple things here. Check this out. You've got 2,300 days, so 2,300 days, and it's saying that the sanctuary will be cleansed. So what do those days mean? What is the sanctuary, and how is it cleansed? Let's see if we can unlock these things. But let's establish a timeline. 2,300 days. Now, Daniel, he's hearing all this, and he knew what the sanctuary was. He understood how the sanctuary was cleansed. But 2,300 days? What does that mean? Daniel gets a little bit more information from Gabriel. Daniel 8, 16, and 17. Notice, he says, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to next week. Listen, I do that to see if you're paying attention. Help me. It refers to what? Okay, so now, check this out. You've got 2,300 days and somehow those 2,300 days are supposed to stretch to the time of the end. How does that happen? Well, this is a prophecy. So we have to find something in the scripture that tells us how to take days and by God's calculation stretch them out to where they cover till the time of the end. Has it been more than 2,300 days since the time of Daniel? So we've got to find something that unlocks this for us, right? And, and it's not going to be human reasoning, because in our minds that doesn't make sense. So we have to look in Scripture and say, okay, Lord, show us a principle of how to understand prophetic days. Let's see if we can find that. But at the end of these 2,300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed, according to Daniel 8, 14. But let's try to figure it out. Well, to get started, we have to go back to Exodus. God met with Moses and he said to him, gave him the blueprints, as it were. He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I might do what? That I might dwell among them. You see, friends, you have to remember, sin came into the picture and it separated God's people from him. And God was working desperately to find a way. And he had the way, but he was implementing his plan to bring humanity back to himself. And so he instituted the sanctuary services. He had already put in place a system of sacrifices. How many of you remember our discussion about Cain and Abel? And we talked about there was nothing wrong with Cain's produce. The only thing wrong with Cain's produce for that offering to God is it wasn't what God asked for. So God puts this system in place. And I have a little video. I want you to just kind of look, and I'm going to walk you through this. This wilderness sanctuary was surrounded by this outer courtyard, and the entrance faced to the east. It was about a quarter mile to the encampment 
But when you walked in to that sanctuary courtyard, you would see that altar of sacrifice. You'd see the bronze laver where they would wash before going into the sanctuary. And then there were these various skins. And this was by direct commandment from God that these skins, the walls, the way everything was made, the way it was assembled was to be portable. But as those walls are taken away, we will be able to see that there are two compartments to this sanctuary. The first part is called the holy place. There was a table of showbread with 12 loaves of bread, each one representing the 12 tribes of Israel. You had the lampstand representing the presence of the Holy Spirit, God with them. You had the altar of incense, incense representing the prayers going up before God. And then that second compartment was the most holy place. This had the Ark of the Covenant. The top of the Ark had the two covering cherubs, representative of those angels around the throne of God. And in between them was what called the mercy seat, a symbolic representation of the throne of God. In the Ark of the Covenant was a bowl of manna, the Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod that budded. This video only shows the Ten Commandments. But you essentially have God's law as the foundation of his throne, the foundation of his kingdom. And so God put this service in place. If you lived in that day and you committed sin, you would have to take an unblemished lamb or other animal, according to God's allowment, you would have to walk that quarter mile distance. A lot of times you will see pictures of the wilderness sanctuary and the encampment of the Israelites is right up on the sanctuary. There was actually about a quarter mile distance. So you'd have to walk out in the open. There was no hiding. You weren't going to slip over there unnoticed. And you walk in, you bring this lamb without spot or blemish, you'd lay your hands on the head of that animal, and a knife would be drawn across the animal's throat. I'm not trying to be graphic or morbid. I know it's sad. And can you imagine having to do that? They would use those temple bowls to catch some of the blood, and that sinner's guilt, as the hands were laid on the head of that animal, was symbolically transferred to that perfect lamb. Part of the sacrifice was then put on the offer of, offer of burnt offering, and this mirrors that Jesus offers the merits of his blood in heaven on our behalf. That's what Hebrews talks about. It says that the priests back then took the blood of calves and goats and sheep, but Jesus came in and made how many sacrifices? One sacrifice. All of this was pointing towards, all of this was foreshadowing what Jesus would do. But as that sin would come in, day after day, those daily offerings were made, and that guilty blood was taken into the sanctuary. As guilty blood is brought into the sanctuary, do you think it cleanses it or defiles it? If you're bringing guilty blood into a holy place, that brings defilement. Are you with me so far? So does it sound like the sanctuary is dirty? Do you think there might need to be a cleansing? Ah, now our minds can start to understand what Daniel understood. That the sanctuary didn't need to be vacuumed. The sanctuary had the defilement of guilty blood, and that defilement needed to be cleansed out. And it was going to be 2,300 days that was towards the end of time. We're going to get there. Hold on. Let's continue to understand this. Once a year, on a day called Yom Kippur, you ever seen that on your calendar? You look on there and you say, what in the world is Yom Kippur? I know you've done it. I grew up in the South, and I grew up, oh, what is Yom Kippur? <laughs> well, Yom is actually pronounced Yom, and it's the Hebrew word for day. And Kippur is actually pronounced Kippur, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is actually the Hebrew phrase that means day of atonement. And so on Yom Kippur, on the day of atonement, the high priest would bring in blood that was not guilty with sin, but it would be innocent blood. There would be two goats that would be selected on Yom Kippur. One would be the Lord's goat. No sin was confessed upon that goat. And the high priest would come in to the most holy place, and he would apply that blood over the mercy seat. And only the high priest could come in. And that holy place, 
the most holy place rather, would be filled with incense. And he would come in and apply that guiltless blood. And that act of applying the guiltless blood was the act of cleansing the defilement out of the sanctuary. How many of you are tracking with me? How did sin come in? Defiled blood. blood, And those were daily sacrifices, right? Each of us messed up. We needed to come make it right with God. We'd bring our animal. We would make our sacrifice. And so day after day, guilty blood is coming in. Are you with me so far? And then one day a year, there needed to be a cleansing to symbolically take away that defilement. Daniel, when he heard the cleansing of the sanctuary, he knew this. It's foreign to us because we don't do this. But Daniel, oh, the cleansing of the sanctuary. That's Yom Kippur. That's the Day of Atonement. What about 2,300 days? But the priest would come in, and every Israelite was required to partake of the Day of Atonement. And if you did not examine your heart and surrender yourself to God in this act of cleansing, then it says that you were actually expelled from God's people. Now get this. Nobody was kicked out involuntarily. So if you went through and participated in the preparation time and you participated in the Day of Atonement, you were right with God and you were cleansed by the blood of those sacrifices, pointing forward to the sacrifice of Jesus. But some would choose not to. But here's just another representation. Daily sacrifices came into the holy place, and the yearly sacrifice took place in the most holy place, and it cleansed the sanctuary of that sin. So what about this? We understand now what the sanctuary is, right? It's that special place where God is worshipped, where the sacrifices are brought in, but we still don't understand this 2,300 days that is supposed to last till the end of time. We still need to unlock that, okay? So let's try to figure that out. But remember this. The Day of Atonement was an illustration of God's judgment in the heavenly sanctuary that will occur just before Jesus comes again. All of these things pointed forward to what Jesus would accomplish on behalf of his people. So how do we unlock this? How do we find out how these 2,300 days? Well, Gabriel is told by God, make this man understand the vision. Daniel was confused. Bless you. Daniel said he was troubled. He said, I I laid down on my bed weak and sick. I couldn't figure this out. It was bothering me. And he's praying, God, help me, tell me. And so Gabriel's told to make it plain to him. So Daniel 8, 16 and 17 He came near where I stood, and he came, I was afraid, and fell on my face, but he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. So at least Daniel had some relief that it was something that would be distant from him, but he didn't know how. So how do we unlock the 2300 days? Well, here is the key that many a faithful Bible student has discovered. This is one of two verses, the other is in Numbers, but Ezekiel 4, 6 is the one I'll share with you this evening. God used an example of when there was a failure. He said, you're going to have to pay the price for that for every day that you doubted. And I'll give you one of the examples. Do you remember when the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness and they had a number of spies? How many spies did they send to spy out the promised land? Twelve spies, one from each tribe, okay? How many came back with a good report? Only two, Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them, listen, this people is overrun by the ascendants, or the the descendants of Anak. You ever read that in the text? Do you know what Anak means? I had to know. Anak means neck. These were the neck people. It does. I'm I'm not, you can't make this stuff up. It's too cool. So he said, you know what? We can't do it. The descendants of the neck people are there. What are the neck people? I'm I can't wait to get to heaven. That's one of my questions. Who are the neck people? Were they these people who just had these monster? I mean, they they don't even have necks, it just goes straight to muscle. Pastor, help me. I, I don't know. But whatever it was, the neck people scared them to death. 
We can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb like, yeah, we've got this. And the rest of them are, no, no, we can't. We should have stayed in Egypt. And so they had to wander in the wilderness a year for every day that they spent spying out the land. They spent 40 days spying out the land. And so they were spent wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And so God uses this symbolic understanding that when we're talking about prophetic days, we can apply this day for year principle. And when we do that, it unlocks these prophecies. And this isn't just something that we as Seventh-day Adventists use. Many Bible scholars who study prophecy have made this same discovery. So we can take the 2,300 prophetic days and understand that it equals how many literal years? Ah, now Daniel's prophecy begins to make sense because if it was 2,300 days from Daniel, biblical reckoning of years was 360 days. You divide 2,300 by 300, 2,300 days by 360, you only get a few years down the road. But when you use this prophetic key, it now stretches way beyond Daniel's time. So, if the Bible gives us a starting point for this 2,300 days, then we can easily calculate the ending. Does that make sense? If I know where to start, I'll know where we're ending. So now we're on the next search of the piece, right? We've got 2,300 years. A sanctuary is going to be cleansed, means that the sin is going to be removed from the sanctuary. But now, how does, where does the 2,300 days start? I'm so glad you asked. I'm dying to tell you. Check this out. All we do is go right back to the book of Daniel. And friends, what did I tell you? When you look at a passage, read before that verse and do what? Read after that verse. So that was Daniel chapter 8. Let's keep reading and let's see if we find something in a subsequent chapter that tells us where this 2300 days starts. So we go to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 and all of a sudden we find another piece of this prophetic puzzle. This is amazing to me. Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. A couple of questions for you. What was Daniel's city? Daniel was of what ethnicity? He's a Jew. He's Jewish. What was the holy city of the Jews? Jerusalem. Okay, so Daniel's city is Jerusalem. Who are his people? I've already told you. The Jews. Daniel's people are the Jews. So this 70 weeks, Daniel, is determined, and that's a word that I'm going to have to unpack for you. 70 weeks are determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city, Jerusalem. Interesting. But this determined comes from the Hebrew word, and this is one of those gutturals. You know what a guttural is? It's one of those words that you have to say like you're clearing your throat. <sighs> kind of sounds, it's unnatural to us because we don't have any words that do that. But it's the Hebrew word, katak, katak. And katak means to be cut off or cut out of. We've, we've translated it in English as determined. In some translation, it actually says separated from. But 70 weeks are determined, separated, cut off for your people in your holy city. So, question for you. We studied the 2300 days in Daniel chapter 8. We're now in which chapter? Now in chapter 9, which prophecy was given before the 70 weeks? So, which time prophecy existed before the 70 weeks? So, now we're seeing that 70 weeks... Out of the 2,300 days, 70 weeks is specifically for the Jews. Are, are you still with me so far? Are you understanding now why I told you to massage your brain a little bit? Okay, but don't get lost. I'm going to give you some visuals. The only time prophecy that has not been established, the beginning and the end, is this 2,300-day prophecy. So the 70 weeks is cut out of that. But we still don't know when it starts. But let's calculate how long this 70 prophetic weeks are. We're going to use the same formula that we used. 70 weeks, 7 days in a week, simple math tells us that it's 490 
prophetic days. And since a day equals a year in Bible prophecy, 490 prophetic days are 490 what? Literal years. So now we know, out of this 2,300 days, 490 of them are going to be specifically for the Jews. But do we have a starting point yet? We still don't have the starting point. But look what we've accomplished so far. Just comparing Scripture with Scripture, we know what the sanctuary is. We know what it means for the sanctuary to be cleansed. Defiled blood has to be taken out as clean blood comes in. We know that this 2,300 days and the 490 are tied together, but we still don't know when it starts. Let's keep reading. We apply the principle, 490 years, and I'm going to keep building this timeline, okay? You're going to have a visual to be able to see this. Many of you may be like me. You need to see it in a visual, so pay attention to the screen. 2,300 prophetic days or literal years, 70 weeks or 490 years, this first part of it is for the Jews. But when does this begin? We don't know yet, but we're going to find out. Daniel 9.25, Gabriel now gives him how to know when it's going to start. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command, notice the two parts here, to do what? Restore and rebuild. Question for you. When Daniel received these prophecies, in Daniel chapter 2 this morning, to which king did he reveal his dream? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, okay? Is Daniel living as a free person? He's living as a captive, right? In 605 B.C., the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The gates were burned down. Uh, the temple was in disrepair. The city was left in ruins. And many of the prominent people, the dignitaries, the children of prominence, were brought off to be captives in the courts of Babylon, Okay, so they had lost two things. The first thing they lost was their national identity because they were living as a captive people. They were not a free nation, and their city was destroyed. So what we're looking for, we're going to find out the beginning of this timeline when we find out when the command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Are you tracking with me so far? So Lotus, we're just letting Scripture define itself. Jerusalem was taken captive. They were not a free people, okay? So we know this 70 weeks has something to do with the restoration of that kingdom. And notice it continues. You, you see the three dots. That means there's a little bit more coming. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be how many? Seven weeks, Seven weeks and 62 weeks. Quick math, 62 and 7 adds up to what? Aren't you glad that God's math is simple? You're laughing like it's not. Listen, we did that without taking our shoes off. I thought that was, I thought that was pretty good. So 69 weeks is going to lead us up till the time of Messiah the Prince. Now notice the connection. This 490 years begins at a time where Jerusalem is given the authority to rebuild themselves as a national people and to rebuild their capital city, and that time is going to carry forward till Messiah the Prince. Who is Messiah the Prince? That's very clear, right? We know who the Messiah is. Seven weeks, 62, 69. So we have to now go back. We have to go back and we have to find when was this decree given? When were God's people allowed to go back? And as you study through the Old Testament, you'll find in the book of Ezra, Ezra was one of the people who led the charge to go back to Jerusalem. And the Persian king, Xerxes, gave the decree. It says, I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay for it from the king's treasury. 
So here they are. They're given the authority now to go back to Jerusalem. They get to reestablish themselves with a national identity. And guess who's paying to rebuild their city? The king. The captor who inherited them from Nebuchadnezzar. Right? How, about, how generous is that? He had no obligation to allow them to go back and do this. And of course, Ezra ties in very closely to the story of Nehemiah. We don't have time to unpack all that. But when you go back and check through history, we find that this decree was issued in the fall of 457 B.C. It's awesome. Because these kings made very good historical records. And those have been preserved for us. And so now we know that this decree from Ezra chapter 7 is the decree that authorized them to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. 457 B.C. Oh, finally, we've got a timeline. Now we know when the 2300 days starts. Now we know when the 70 weeks, the 490 years start. This decree is given, and this is part one. Because Daniel said, it is for your people and your holy city. And we determined that Daniel's people are the Jews and his holy city is Jerusalem. So all of this is coming together beautifully. And it said that there will be seven weeks and 62 up until Messiah the Prince. So this is going to lead us. This 457 is going to carry us all the way through to the time of Jesus. And friends, here's where it really gets, here's where it just gets super cool. What does Messiah mean? No. Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach. In Greek, many times we think Jesus has a last name. What do many people think Jesus' last name is? Christ. But it's a title. It comes from the Greek word Christos. Mashiach, Messiah, And Christos, or Christ, means the same thing. It means anointed one. So Messiah is the anointed one. Hang on to that. This part two, though, if you do the math, 490 years for the Jews, and then that leaves 1,810 years for the Gentiles. Okay, we'll unpack that in just a moment. I just want you to see what the two major parts are for our timeline so far. So what about this 483 years? Begins in 457 B.C., that decree that Xerxes gave for the people there in Ezra chapter 7, and we're told that it leads up to Messiah the Prince. Hmm. Unto Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, that total of 69. Messiah simply means the anointed one. Question for you. When was Jesus anointed? Here's another question for you. Here's my brain teaser for you tonight. If Messiah means anointed one, was Jesus the Messiah before he was anointed? When we elect a president, are they the president before they're sworn in? What are they called? So technically... Jesus was Messiah-elect. Well, I mean, didn't he come to John? And what did, what did John say to him? I'm not even worthy to take off your sandal. You should be baptizing me. What did Jesus say? No, permit it to be so that we might fulfill all righteousness. You see, friends, Jesus was not baptized to take away sin as you and I are baptized. We follow in his example But Jesus was baptized to fulfill righteousness, and we know that it was at his baptism that the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and Jesus was then anointed. He became the Messiah. Yes, we know that, and people get upset with me when I tell them that, but that's why Jesus said, I have to follow through with what I've been told to do, and I have to follow the plan that I put in place. But he became the anointed one, And we know that it was A.D. 27. Wow! We know exactly when Jesus was baptized. You say, well, Pastor, how do you know that? I can tell you're not smarter than anybody else. Well, you're right. All I did was read the scripture. 
Look at what Scripture tells us. We see Jesus' baptism, and all we have to do is look through the Scripture and say, when was Jesus baptized? The Bible tells us very clearly, Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, how many of you believe that the Romans kept track of the years of the Caesars? And guess what? The 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar is A.D. 27. I love it. 457 B.C. You do the math, the 483 days, I mean, you come up and it falls in A.D. 27. You say, well, wait a minute. What happens when you go from B.C. to A.D.? Well, some people wonder, is there a zero day? No. The way historians, every historian, not just Adventists, every historian knows that you go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. And when you do the calculation, we know definitively that Jesus was baptized in A.D. 27. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. And what that tells me is that nobody, and you say, well, how do you know Jesus was baptized? Uh, let me show you the other verse. Other verse. Luke 3.21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was what? Baptized. Friends, there is no doubt, absolutely no doubt, that Jesus is the Messiah. There's no question that when you and I accept Jesus, we're not accepting some sort of fairy tale. We're not accepting some conjuring or devising of men. We're simply following and accepting the Jesus of Bible prophecy. Nobody else can take his place. Why? Because nobody else fits the timeline that God established through his prophetic word. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. I want to stop here for just a second. I have many Christian friends who when they read about this part of Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, they try to assign part of this to the Antichrist. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, let me show you. Verse 27 says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many, for one week. And so we have this 69 weeks, and we have one prophetic week that is left. Simple math for you. 69. What number follows 69? Some of my well-intending Christian friends take that last week, Daniel's 70th week, and they throw it down to the end of time, and they will tell you that that 70th week really represents seven years of tribulation after the Christians have been raptured and disappeared and the wicked are left here and they have a seven-year grace period to get it right the second time. Friends, there's nothing, absolutely nothing in Scripture that supports that teaching. And it says that Messiah was cut off in the middle of the week. Okay, Jesus' baptism happened in A.D. 27. And if he was cut off in the middle of the week... How much is half of seven? Simple math, right? And we know that the decree, 457, went out in the fall. So we can gather from that that Jesus was baptized in the fall of A.D. 27. Add 3 to 27. Comes to 30. And if we started in the fall, we're in the fall of A.D. 30. Are you still with me? If I add half a year to that, where does that take me? Spring of the next year, and which year comes after 30? 31. So in the spring of A.D. 31, something happened. What does Scripture tell us happened in the middle of the week? And what about this part that says, Messiah the Prince will confirm a covenant with many for one week? Again, there are Christians who try to apply this to an Antichrist power. But when we look in the Scripture, we find out that Jesus is the one who confirmed a covenant. We'll see it in just a moment. But notice this part. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Again, people get confused and they say, well, it's Antichrist power down at the last days during the tribulation. They're the ones who bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Let's see if the scripture bears that out. We see Jesus' baptism. We establish that half of a week is three and a half. 
So what happened in A.D. 31? Friends, that brings us to the cross. Do you know when Passover took place? Passover took place in the spring. When you look at that Passion Week, it was the prelude to Passover. And Paul refers very clearly to Jesus as the Passover lamb. So we know definitively that it was the spring of the year that Jesus was crucified. Now, why did Jesus go to the cross? This shouldn't be a trick question. He who knew no sin became sin for us, for me, for you. So Jesus went to the cross to bear the sins of his people. Daniel 9, my friends, is about Jesus Christ, our Messiah. He took away our sin. He is the one who brought an end to offering and sacrifice. You say, how do you know that Jesus brought an end to offering and sacrifice? Well, let's continue to look at Scripture. Matthew 26, just before he is crucified, this is leading up, this is the Passover feast that they're celebrating. This is on Thursday night. He, Jesus, took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood. Of course, not literal blood. So he's saying this is a symbol of my blood, and it's the blood of what covenant? New covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And friends, not only was Jesus baptized on time, guess what? He was crucified exactly on time, according to the prophetic timeline established in Daniel Years and years, almost 500 years before it actually happened. Why? Jesus came when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, Galatians 4, 4 tells us. In Mark 1, 15, Jesus makes the declaration himself, the time is fulfilled. He understood what he was supposed to do. He understood what he was coming to accomplish. Romans 5, 6, Paul tells us that in due time, or we could even say at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And what about this part? In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Why would we try to apply that to an antichrist power when Jesus is the one who took away sacrifice and offering? So, Pastor, how do you know that? Because God symbolized that when Jesus drew his last breath on the cross, that heavy veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Mark 15, 38. And I mentioned to you that veil last week, or maybe it was the week before, I can't remember, I've slept since then. But in Herod's temple, the inside of that temple was about 90 feet tall. This veil was about 90 feet tall. And it was a multi-layered veil that historians estimate was up to almost four inches thick. How is a veil like that going to be torn in two from top to bottom? Miraculous. It was an angel of God. And notice that veil separated the holy place from the most holy place. And so when that veil was torn, the most holy place was laid bare. Thus God was symbolizing, no more do we need an earthly sacrificial system because my son has paid the price for all sin. Praise God. So why would I say that the Antichrist brings an end to sacrifice when it's very clear that Jesus brought an end to sacrifice? He's the one who fulfilled the sacrificial system. Christ was baptized on time. We know that he was baptized in A.D. 27. Praise God that we know that. Nobody else can ever fulfill that. And of course, he was cut off in the middle of the week. Three and a half years later, A.D. 31, and Christ was crucified right on time. And of course, now he takes that blood, and Paul talks about in Hebrews how he applies that blood to the account of every believer who will choose to follow Christ. Let me ask you tonight, how many of you would like the blood of Christ applied to your account? <sighs> Please, Lord Jesus, wipe away my sin. So let's put a few things on our timeline. We've got the decree. We know when that started. We know that takes us up to Jesus' baptism. Luke chapter 3 tells us it was A.D. 27, so we know the timeline is right on track. Three and a half years later, Jesus was crucified in A.D. 31. 
But now we're left with three and a half years. And again, simple math, that just takes us down to A.D. 34. What happened in A.D. 34? Well, if you go to the book of Acts, you will discover that there was a guy by the name of Stephen. And if you go listen to Stephen's sermon, I've heard some of my deacons over the years in churches tell me, well, pastor, deacons aren't supposed to preach when I ask them to preach and they want to get out of it. I said, I guess you forgot about Stephen. And I did have one deacon tell me, we'll see how that worked out for him. (laughs) Touche, touche. But deacons are supposed to be preachers too. And Stephen was preaching and, and he was trying to win their hearts to the Messiah. But their hearts were not tender towards God. Their hearts were hardened towards God. And when they heard his sermon, when he went over the course of history, how they had rejected God, how they had rejected the Messiah, they got angry. And they pick up stones. Notice this image. Guess who that figure is in dark, holding others' robes? The Bible tells us that Saul of Tarsus was on his way to becoming part of the Sanhedrin. And it said that he was there holding the cloaks or the tunics of the others. And he was in agreement with the stoning of Stephen. He didn't do it, but he was present. And this artist has captured that. And of course, as Stephen was beaten to death by those stones, this was symbolic of God's people rejecting God's message. That 490 years came to a screeching halt with the stoning of Stephen. At the end of this prophecy, the Jewish nation rejects Jesus as Messiah by stoning Stephen. The gospel then goes to the Gentiles and the world. The friends I know were embroiled... The, The nation of Israel is embroiled in a a brutal and bloody battle with Hamas, uh, with Palestinian believers. And of course, not all Palestinian people are evil. Hamas is a terrorist organization. And many Christians, they're rallying to want to come to Israel's support. And I believe that we should have support for any innocent people who are being unfairly attacked, right? We should throw our support at least verbally and philosophically. But many Christians think... Well, Israel still has the favor of God in Israel alone. Well, guess what? We find that there's a transition in the New Testament when the nation of Israel rejected God at the stoning of Stephen, that spiritual Israel emerges, and all of us who embrace Jesus are now part of spiritual Israel, and God's blessings are with us, but the gospel also went to the Gentile world. And so we see now, That 490 years is over, and it leaves that second part. That 70 weeks that were determined for God's people and for the holy city, they have now been accomplished in A.D. 34. And friends, you have watched. You have walked through this with me. We have found each piece of this locked away in Scripture. Have you seen that this evening? Right? The only thing we had to go to for the historical record were two things. When did the decree of Ezra 7 get issued. History tells us 457 B.C. When was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar? History tells us it was 27 A.D. The rest of this, we have unlocked it together completely by walking through Scripture. So this 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed, we still have part of this that has not been fulfilled. We still have part two, the gospel going to the Gentiles, this 1810 years. And if you do the math, 1810 plus 34 takes you down to 1844. So in 1844 is when we find that this period of judgment mentioned in Revelation 14, that's when this period of judgment, this day of atonement, this heavenly Yom Kippur began. And our world has been living in a time of judgment since 1844. Say, well, what does that mean? Well, very simply, it simply means that we find now the fulfillment of this prophecy. The 2300-day prophecy ended in 1844. Now we're living in God's judgment hour. But what does that mean? Question for you. Who's your judge when it comes to spiritual things? Who's your lawyer when it comes to spiritual things? Is Jesus God? So your judge... Your lawyer, and who's your jury? If that's not a rigged court, I've never heard of one. 
Praise God. (laughs) Here's my point. If your judge, your jury, and your lawyer are all the God who loved you and put in place the plan of salvation, if you're on God's side, how can you lose in the judgment? You can't. The beautiful thing is, is that we as Christians do not have to fear the judgment. I'm going to tell you, if I got a speeding ticket and the judge trying my little case was also my lawyer and my judge, how worried am I about the speeding ticket? That's a rigged court, right? But it's fair because God has not sinned and he judges fairly. Amen? So we don't have to fear about living in this judgment hour. You say, so what's the big deal? The big deal is it's the last days of earth's history. Do I know when Jesus is coming? No, I can't tell you. But I have read in Scripture that I should live soberly, that I should live watching for Jesus coming, and I should live in a way that if I claim to be his disciple, I should walk with my Jesus. So it's no time to be playing around with our spirituality. We need to be serious. We need to fear God and give glory to him Because we are living in this hour of judgment. And friends, please, it's nothing to be feared as long as you walk with Jesus. I want to walk with Jesus tonight. How about you? I'm going to bow my head on a daily basis. And I'm going to say, Lord, please, accept me afresh. Cleanse me afresh. I want to tell you a little story as I close. There was a a German guy by the name of Frederick Wilhelm Herschel. This guy was drafted into the war. And one night, in the heat of battle, afraid for his life, he became a deserter. He left the battle, abandoned his unit, goes back home, and he was overwhelmed, overcome with the fear of battle. Well, his father, so that he didn't get locked up, and in these days... If you deserted, you were shot by firing squad. His father ships him off to England, and Wilhelm becomes William. So William Herschel is now growing up in England, and you see, what is he known for, according to the little label? He actually discovered a planet. Maybe you recognize the planet in the background. It looks like Saturn because it has a ring, But that is a recent photo from NASA. That's actually the planet Uranus. Uranus also has rings. I didn't know that until recently. I I thought Saturn, right, only had the rings. But William Herschel is credited the first person to discover the planet Uranus. And so he becomes famous. You know, he's part of the scientific community. He's lauded for his um, discovery of this planet. But he also is living under this cloud of having been a deserter back in Germany. Well, the king of England sent for William to appear before him. Do you think William was excited or afraid? Is this about my scientific discoveries or is this about my desertion? Well, the king's grandfather, George II, was the one who ruled Germany when William had deserted from the army. William knew this, and so he was afraid that his desertion was finally catching up to him. He goes in, and he's waiting to see the king, and a servant approached. The door never opened for him to go into the king. A servant simply approached and handed him an envelope. Shaking with trepidation, he opens the envelope, and what he finds is that the king issued a full pardon. William was deserving of what? He was a deserter. He turned his back on his country in the heat of battle. He fled the battlefield. He was supposed to be shot. You and I deserve a sentence of death. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, Paul says, is death. But friends, guess what? You and I serve a greater king. We serve a king who says, you don't have to die for your sins. You can, but there's another option. I'm the other option. And if you will accept me, 
He says, I will give you pardon. I close with this, 1 John 2, 1 and 2. John writes, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not, what? Sin. And if anyone sins, don't, 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 don't despair. We have an advocate with the Father. Who's our advocate, friends? Jesus Christ, the righteousness, or the righteous. And he himself, he, Jesus, is the propitiation or the payment for our sins. And not only for ours only, but also for how much? But yet you have Christians who will tell you that God only chose to save some people. My Jesus didn't die to save just some people. He died to save all who will accept him. The question tonight is, do we accept him? Yes, there was this part where we can see definitively that Jesus is who he claims to be. Can you see why I get excited about this prophecy? Nothing else definitively nails down that Jesus is who he claims he is. And now we're living in that hour of judgment, but hey, that's okay. Because if I'm living in a judgment hour with the judge, everything's going to be okay. Tonight, will you trust him? Will you trust Jesus to carry you through the judgment? and allow your heart and life to be cleansed by his word. Tonight, I would like to raise my hand and simply say, Dear Jesus, by your grace, I want to be saved by your blood. How many of you would like to make that commitment with me this evening? Let me pray with you. Dear Father, Lord, I know we...